Hello, fellow working preachers. This is Caroline Lewis, and I'm excited to announce we are kicking off the spring fundraising campaign today. All gifts made to the spring campaign through May 31st will be doubled with a dollar for dollar match up to $10,000. When you make your gift to the spring campaign, we will send you links to presentations by the Sermon Brainwave team from this year's Festival of Homiletics. Working Preacher would not be possible without generous donors like you, and we are so grateful for each and every one of you. Make your gift online today at workingpreacher.org. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Joy J. Moore. The text for the fourth Sunday of Easter on May 8th, 2022, are Acts 9, 36 through 43, Psalm 23, Revelation 7, 9 through 17, and John 10, 22 through 30. Something that I didn't know existed until we started podcasting, what, 11 years ago or so, is that there's actually a thing called Good Shepherd Sunday. Yes, happy Good Shepherd Sunday I to you no all. no idea this existed until we started this. Always the fourth Sunday of Easter. Always the gospel lesson is a selection from chapter 10 of the Gospel of John. So year A, chapter 10, verses 1 through 10. Year B, chapter 10, 11 through 18 even though Jesus hasn't stopped talking between 10 and 11, so but you have to wait a whole year to get the rest of the discourse. And then year C, 22 to 30, which has nothing to do with 9, 1 through 10, 21, which is the larger block of the narrative, because the shepherd discourse is the discourse that goes with the sign of the raising or of the healing of the man born blind, but it mentions shepherds and sheep. Can, can I point and, one thing out? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, some people don't realize because they're not watching this on YouTube, but just listening that we're doing this on Zoom in different places and we can see each other. You just went through all of those chapters and verses without looking at notes, as far as I can tell. Yeah. So you know, you are, you know, all of the delineations of Good Shepherd Sunday over the lecture. Yes, I do. Yes. Is it always Psalm 23? It should be. Yes. Yeah. But uh, yeah, 10, 1 to 10, 11 to 18. Yes. Yeah. 22 to 30, because this is about sheep. I, uh, and again, and so we need, you know, we need sheep on Good Shepherd Sunday. I always have been like, I don't like 10, one through 10 is actually not about really the shepherds more about the door, but, but door Sunday doesn't sound as good as Shepherd, no. shepherd Sunday. Let's and talk we don't about have this. Many hymns. We don't have a lot of door or gate hymns. We have more uh, shepherd hymns. So here we are. Let's talk about, but, we've been setting this up for a couple of weeks. We've talked about the yeah. shepherding imagery and the idea of sheep who find pasture and security. Right. And so what you, uh, and this also takes place at a completely different time. This is the Feast of Dedication, which is a, uh, which is a winter festival, Hanukkah. And, uh, and the previous was Jesus was in Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles, we think in, in 9-1 through 10-21. So it's a different uh, period of time. But I think what you do as a, preacher when it comes to this passage is you really draw on, as you said, Matt, those promises that uh, uh, the way in which Jesus describes himself as the shepherd in 10, 1 through, uh, well, really 10, 9 through, well, really 10, 35, 9, 35 through 10, 18. But anyway, uh, where Jesus describes uh, what it means for him to be the shepherd and what it means to be the sheep. And so that you bring all of this all of that to bear here. The sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I, I go in and they go in and out and find pasture. You get this, I give them eternal life and they will never perish. That eternal life could be connected to John 10, 10. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And that you not detach any of this as sort of uh, unconnected from the reality of the previous language about shepherd and sheep is tied to the man born blind, that the, that man has now been given abundant life as Jesus' sheep. And uh, and the, the other two things I would name from this is uh, that beautiful phrase, no one will snatch them out of my hand, um, is a, is a, a, 
is a lovely promise there. Uh, and it goes back also to the, and the threats, the threats that exist that the thieves and the bandits try to get in by my, by another way, the wolves, right. Are outside and, and that protection. So it's fundamentally an image of protection and, uh, and that the father and I are one, uh, that, that one there is a neuter word. It's not a masculine. This is not Jesus saying like, I am, you know, I and the father are one person. So don't go all doctrinal here, but it's really the way in which, uh, the, the way in which Jesus as the shepherd is of course, an extension of God. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's embodying God's provision, God's care, God's, uh, tending God's, um, God, the image of God as shepherd, as good shepherd, uh, that's what Jesus is doing. And so he's making a direct connection to his own identity and his own ministry uh, as one who has um, embodied that, that promise of, of the good shepherd of God. Okay. I appreciate, that's brilliant always. But I appreciate that embodiment language because that's what it means to be human, right? that we bear the image of God. And so um, that, that's our task. We talked about that last week in terms of what we are doing is we are being Christ-like in the world. And so just as Jesus is doing the work of God, the creator, so we are doing the work that uh, through the spirit, we are doing the work that Jesus did on earth. We are to be shepherds uh, as we described last week with, 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 with Peter. Yeah, and it ties. Yeah, and it ties back to uh, verse twenty-five. I have told you, and you do not believe the works that I do in my Father's name. Testify to me, and those works primarily are uh, that that work is to for Jesus to be, you know, to be the I am in the world. That's the and to bring about um, that that and to bring about that possibility of relationship with Him and with God. And so. You really you could you can tie this back to John the beginning of the chapter of nine, you know why was this man born blind so that the works the works of, the, of God might be revealed in him, and that but the fundamental work is is Jesus <laughs> incarnating the I am uh, in the world and uh, and and one of the ways in which Jesus does that is through this you know image of the shepherd. Mm-hmm. So, all right. Uh, I'll say one thing. Can I say one thing briefly? Yes. Just the language of belonging being so powerful in there in verse 26 of Beth Johnson, her commentary. Yes. Everything depends on belonging to him. Yeah. But belonging is a word that gets used a lot in church circles these days as we're struggling to think about how hospitality is not quite the right word. Inclusion is not quite the right word, but to think about belonging and mutual belonging and what that looks like and the intimacy uh, involved there and how that begins with the idea of belonging to God. Um, I, I'm Presbyterian. Our brief statement of faith talks about how in life and in death, we belong to God is one of the, the, kind of the, I think the core, the uniting confession of that, of that statement. It's just worth exploring a little bit and how that means yeah. to, belonging to one another and I'm really glad you mentioned that, Matt, because the the commentary uh, by, by Beth uh, Johnson is it does a beautiful job with that, and that uh, and actually I highlighted and starred the paragraph where she says, by contrast, the Good Shepherd tells us that everything depends on belonging to Him. Never does our status before God depend on how we feel, on having the right experience, on being free of doubt, or on what we accomplish. It depends on one thing only, that we are known by the shepherd. And particularly in contrast with that, um, the term works, which can so easily turn into, for some, an earning of God's favor. Uh, and that's that's what really has to be, uh, that has to be uh, corrected here, particularly, because it's all about being known. That that's that. What does it mean? What does it mean to belong? Um, this is where my what my Wesleyan theology is 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 uh, important for me because 
Wesley's understanding of the actions of our faith are because we belong, because we are a part of this uh, community. This is just what we do. And it's not, it, it's again, it's not prescriptive, it's descriptive. Um, how do you know? Uh, and, and in some ways that that leans us into, you know, what Je how Jesus is answering this question, you know, you know, you're going to keep us in suspense. No, it's mm -hmm. been right there before you all along mm -hmm. that open your eyes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ouch. Tabitha, I remember uh, I remember way, way, way back in the beginning days of of doing Sermon Brainwave. Matt, where you and I had an enlivening discussion about Dorcas meaning gazelle. <laughs> or you said something like, does anybody know what Dorcas means? And I'm like, gazelle, woo. <laughs> you won that day. Yeah, that's, absolutely. That's a, not that it helps with the preaching, but I just remember that. Like, I know what it means, gazelle. <laughs> anyway. Well, in the, in the Middle East, that's like, um, there are a whole bunch of gazelles. <laughs> So. Yeah, only one has kind of caught on in English, though, although I, I always ask students when I teach acts if anybody knows somebody named Dorcas, and it's usually somebody of a, uh, of a more senior generation, if somebody yes. knows anybody, but nevertheless, that's an important detail. So she's got both a Greek and a Hebrew name, or Greek and an Aramaic name, mm -hmm. which in a book that has already had some tension between the Hebrews and the Hellenists in chapter six around distribution of food in a book where the Holy Spirit comes and empowers people to speak in known languages of all sorts of people. You've got somebody who could very well be bilingual or bicultural, mm -hmm. uh, maybe somebody who's able to bring those communities together, who's able to stand in the gap and do that. Uh, I, I've, every time I talk about this, I talk about how I th just think it's a beautiful story, largely because of the way it breaks the form of a lot of healing stories and let's us spend just a little tiny bit of time with this woman who's called a disciple into her ministry, which is one where people obviously love her deeply and where her loss is a tremendous blow to this community's ability to have fellowship, uh, maybe to know and to love each other at, and around clothing too. And some interpreters have done a lot with that about somebody who uh, adorns or cares for the bodies of others or keeps people warm I and mean, all of those types of things. It's, mm -hmm. I don't want to romanticize this. I don't want to call it women's work in a book that is so dominated by male public figures like Acts. But I want, I want people to know this story. I want people to know who this woman was, is, and, and how she, she represents a church that puts a lot of effort into maintaining uh, the well-being of its member, especially if you, you know, here's my here's my bigger gripe that the Book of Acts has in many ways been uh, perverted by a lot of the missional theology movement to make it a book about numbers and growth and expansion, and is sometimes treated as if Acts is a book that tells us the church is always blowing itself up and starting over, or the church is always you know, outward focused. Uh, there's ways in which, of course, that's true, but it makes a straw person out of people like Tabitha. Mm -hmm. who is holding the whole damn thing together and making sure that the people who come into the church find security and connection there. So, and, 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 and that, that security and connection are, are acts of discipleship and mission. And exactly. And, and you know, that, that the mission, yeah, that, that, uh, yeah, that that's what discipleship looks like. And she's called a disciple, you know, the feminine form of disciple, she is named a disciple and that her uh, and that what she does and how she does it are uh, are extensions of that identity. And it's again, I appreciate uh, lifting this up because it's again in a culture where women are, are, are not uh, noticed, uh, where women are marginalized. Um, for this to be included, and as you said, lingered on, Matt, um, is significant. And um, that's the countercultural narrative, a way of the narrative of scripture. And, and sometimes we, we, don't, we don't recognize that there aren't a lot of stories, but the fact that there are stories is incredible because 
this is a time when women would not be noticed in this way at all. So it, it's a huge statement uh, to have this story included. And, and so I appreciate you, you lingering here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Uh, Psalm 23, this is- I have a question. I have a question, oh. uh, partly because this comes after uh, the, the Tabitha uh, story. And, and that is, does anybody know when Psalm 23 became a funeral favorite? I do not. I do not. Mm -hmm. You know, you know it, reading it after this story, that was the question that came to my mind. Um, reading it after John 10 is a very different read. Yeah, or reading you know, it in Easter. I mean, it really does. I point this out when I teach, uh, and I probably did when, when, when we taught together, Joy. I, I talk about this in, in my preaching class as here you have this really familiar psalm, right? That, that, mm -hmm. that is often a psalm that is, that is requested in funerals. But how does uh, how does a psalm like this sound after John ten or in the middle of Easter? Uh, how does it how does it sound? What 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 do you hear or hear? <laughs> and now uh, that you might hear differently, were the psalm to be read uh, in a different kind of context? So. Exactly. After teaching with you that that question or that view of Psalm twenty three. Has, has been what I've been thinking. And so it really stood out for me as I was preparing for today. It's like, oh, here it is back in, in the funeral context. And I hadn't been doing that uh, since we talked together. I would, okay, well, I, well, yeah. And I would, uh, this Psalm, I would use, okay, this is gonna surprise both of you. I would use it liturgically. No. <laughs> but, I would use it as the statement of faith, uh, which uh, I know some traditions can't do that, but like to say it after the psalm, I mean, after the sermon, you're talking about it, depending on what you're preaching on, if you're preaching um, Acts or maybe, but rather than read it, uh, if you were going to do John, if you were going to do John 10 and talk about Jesus as the good shepherd, I would not read it. I would preach on that and then plea, and then I'd say, and now we're going to confess our faith. The Lord is my shepherd. My shepherd. I that's love it. That's what I would, that's how I would do it. I love if it. If I were planning I worship, <laughs> go ahead. What? I, I was just going to say, if I think, and this is the, here's, here's what happens when you get a bunch of Bible scholars together. This is a great opportunity for a preacher to help people become better Bible readers if, if you were to invite people into this conversation we just had to, it depends on how many texts you're going to read and what you're going to preach about. But it's possible to invite people into imagining how does Psalm 23 sound with John 10? How does it sound with Acts yeah. 9? And to help them see the resonance of a text depending upon the setting, which of course everybody does, but to call it to their consciousness, mm -hmm. or everybody's capable of that without the preacher telling them to do that, but to call that to their consciousness mm -hmm. and to invite them to read scripture, not with the question of what does this mean? What's the answer? Who's got the answer? But how does it how does it speak into various situations how does the metaphor of the divine shepherd do that mm -hmm. uh, I, I could imagine some worship settings where you could do a, a teaching moment around that that could empower your people to read more expansively mm -hmm. yeah. or you could just preach on revelation seven speaking of myriads and multitudes and uh uh a theme that we've been nobody could about. count it Nobody could count it, Nobody you know, count. not like the hundred, not like the 153 fish. You However, couldn't cut them out. You couldn't use construction paper and cut all these out. There's so many. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and the multitude, of course, follows the 144,000. Yeah. So anyway, so our point is there's a lot of people here, but it's also yes. people from all over the place. Oh, right. It's a global crowd. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. For God so love the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, and then I, I want to highlight uh, just uh, again uh, Daniel's um, uh, commentary um, to set revelations. Revelations is a letter to seven churches made up of poor and marginalized folks trying to survive, resist, 
and refuse assimilation into the Roman Empire. And I, I just, I mean, it's a great commentary, but that right there is the setup that I hope that as folks are moving their way through Revelation, that they will, will recognize that's the moment we're living in and to read this book um, in, in that anticipation. How do you get every nation, every tongue, every tribe, every people to be able to recognize that their survival is resistance and refusing to assimilate to the empire? And that worship and singing is an act of resistance. Yes, yes. That worship and singing of, well, go ahead, Matt. No, keep going. I, I'm gonna go ahead. No, I. Not, now I want to know what Matt's gonna say too. I know. I, I don't want to cut you off, and that meant. No, go ahead. Yeah, that's what I said. Well, um, I also want to say, unless it, unless these people aren't, I, I mean, I. Um. John surely wants the people who are reading the book of Revelation to become people like this, to, to bear mm -hmm. witness, to stand up. And John's calling them to a witness that I think John imagines is going to be fatal, that's going to probably going to kill them. They're going to imitate the first witness, Jesus, yes. in dying like that. Yes. So here, worship is, these are, what unites these people in the scene is that they've all been killed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. So worship isn't going to protect them. No. But it's the response to it saved for what saved for a witness that embodies Jesus own witness, which is a self sacrificial witness, or I should say a self giving witness and then. Um, but then it concludes in worship and in comfort with God will wiping every tear from their eyes and mm -hmm. so I see I mean i'm not disagreeing I think with you both but i'm saying. Before we run to the happy ending, let's also acknowledge that John's oh, trying to urge a congregation to do something very, very dangerous. Yeah. That, the journey, that the journey requires sacrifice. I mean, resistance to me means just that. Um, if yeah. I read that out at, at, at of African-American history, uh, uh, particularly, uh, well, not just the work of the 20th century, the work of the 19th century as well, but uh, particularly the work of the 20th century, when you think of all of the music um, that was used. And then that's why I said in the 19th century too, because, you know, during uh, the, uh, the, um, those who were running away from slavery, um, a lot of their symbolism, uh, the way that they were calling one another were the songs that they were singing across the, across the plantations. And so, uh, but there was also this reality, this reality that if I leave and I get caught, I could be killed. And sometimes when we think of our resistance today, you know, going to jail or being a part of a protest is like something we're going to put on our resume so our grandchildren knew we stood for what was right in our culture. And we don't have the sense that in the 20th century, you know, when, when the civil rights um, workers went to jail, they didn't know if they were going home again. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and are we willing to resist the empire? Mm -hmm. At yeah. that level, so so Matt, I really appreciate I really appreciate that and and the 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 singing, yes, it is celebratory, but at, at least in the 19th century, it was um, it was um, um, what's the word when when it, it was secretive? You know, it's like we're just going to sing these wonderful choruses that you know the uh, the slave owners like to hear us sing. And that's a code. That's a word. It's the but code for us to know tonight, tonight, and we're out of here. Yeah. And then that, and and how this is code too, right? Yes. This, 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 these, what they're singing here is code as well. And and if you think about uh, the way in which it, the passage ends, uh, is the the lamb at the center of the throne, right? in the midst of the imperial reality, realities uh, will be their shepherd and he will guide them to springs of the water of life. So that's fast forwarding to Revelation 22 and the promise of that springs of life and the hope of the springs of life. And then God will wipe away every tear from their eyes forwarding to, um, to chapter 21. So, uh, so all these they're giving witness in this moment, but also witness to their witness to the truth of God's future that they know is their future. Which is something in which we can join, right? So one of yeah. the things Revelation is doing is collapsing the divide between what we can see here and what's real. Uh, We're one of there. the myriads. 
Well, exactly. And so maybe part of what the preaching here does, and I think it's it's partly there in in the in the narratives of, of people escaping slavery and in aspects of the civil rights movement, is that 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 barrier also divides that that the worship we engage in now we are joined by ancestors by those who, whose legacy we stand who resisted uh, and so to help people get a sense of that collapsing not just in space but really temporally as well yeah which is where the power is it's not heaven when i die it's the kingdom of god coming to earth <laughs>